This is a clinical problem-solving exercise with Robbie Geha. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the box. We'll take a look. The session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube in the next day or two. Closed captioning is available. CME is offered at the end if you're interested. Stay on for instructions. Uh, these are among our most fun sessions. A special thanks to, uh, to Vita Garcia and Anna Fretz, our chief residents, for putting this together. Uh, people probably know the format, but let me uh, go ahead and tell you about uh, these, these uh, clinical problem solving cases. Our discussant, who I'll introduce in a second, has not uh, heard about the case at all, so is, is blinded to it, and uh, we'll be learning about it in real time as you do. Our goal is to uh, learn the thought process of a master clinician and teacher, and not necessarily get the case right, although I know that's always uh, one of the goals. Uh, they're not magicians. You don't have to know everything, although it helps to know something. Uh, and it's about the journey, not the outcome. And we encourage you to follow along and try to think through the case, uh, which will help you learn more uh, from it. And uh, enjoy it. It should be fun, and it usually is, and I think it's a terrific case. So um, let me bring on our discussant. So this is Robbie Geha, who is really one of the extraordinary uh, clinician uh, teachers that we have at UCSF. Robbie is assistant professor of medicine based at the VA. Uh, he is director of education for the uh, VA emergency department and uh, may very well be best known for having been the uh, founder or co-founder of the Clinical Problem Solvers, which is an extraordinary, uh, oh, it's pod podcast, resource, initiative, it's everything. Uh, which has educated many of us in how to think about complicated cases and how to uh, how to be better clinicians uh, through really a, a masterful job that they've done in putting together a whole variety of resources, some of which you'll experience today. And uh, Robbie tells me they have had now more than 10 million visits uh, since they uh, they launched several years ago. So, congratulations on that. And Robbie, welcome. I'm glad you're here here and with us. Uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's great to be on home turf discussing a case, and I'm thrilled to be here. Great. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a fairly complicated case, so it'll take a little time to uh, to go through. And uh, we have we have stop points built in, but you obviously feel free to stop any point that you want to make uh, make some teaching points. All right, ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, this is a, the HPI, 68-year-old man with a past history of hypertension and alcohol use disorder has been out of care for several uh, years. Let me actually shrink my screen so I can see the whole slide. So, several decades. Presents with fatigue. He reports generalized uh, weakness for the last three months, intermittent cough and dyspnea on exertion for, for months, non-bloody diarrhea for the last several weeks. He's had some recent weight loss that he can't quantify, no recent travel, no sick contacts. He's not seen a doctor in more than 20 years. On review of systems, no fevers, chills, sweats, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or constipation. Uh, past history already mentioned, hypertension, uh, AUD. Uh, he's on uh, ibuprofen every now and then. Uh, no drug allergies. Uh, he's had uh, surgery for cervical spine stenosis, don't know when. No known family history, social history. Uh, lives 80 miles south of Eureka. He's got cats and dogs, drinks five beers a night, smokes six cigarettes per day for more than 30 years, no drug use, and he's a retired Marine. On physical exam, uh, he is, uh, his vitals are uh, Blood pressure is fine, heart rate 85. He, he's somewhat desaturated, 87% on room air, up to 98% on four liters. Respiratory rate's 18. And he is febrile, 102.9. He looks okay. Uh, no ulcerations, no sinus tenderness, no lymphadenopathy. He's got a three out of six diastolic murmur at the apex, no rubs. On lung exam, he's got bilateral scattered crackles, uh, no wheezing. Abdomen is fine with no organomegaly or tenderness. Skin has no rashes, he has no joint effusions or tenderness, no muscle tenderness, normal bulk, and uh, his neurologic exam is noted to be normal. On initial labs, he's got a white count of 18,000, otherwise fine CBC, his EOs are 5.7, his ANC is 9.2, uh, and you see the leukocyte and basophil count. 
He's got hypersegmented neutrophils. Troponin is negative. His urinalysis is moderately active with 50 white cells, 11, 20 red cells, negative nitrite. HIV, COVID, uh, RVP are negative. CV, uh, hepatitis C virus antibodies positive. Viral load is undetectable. Hepatitis B antigen antibody are negative, and you see his LFTs are fine. Um, and we have a smear there with the hypersegmented neutrophils. And so, let me, so uh, let's turn it to you, Robbie. And the question is, how are you framing the case? We've given you a whole lot of information. Happy to go backwards and highlight any portion of it. Chief residents were in a generous mood and put the abnormal stuff in red. Uh, but uh, happy to go backwards. But uh, it's a lot of a lot of info coming to you in a short period of time. Uh, how do you even begin to think through this case? Yeah, you know, I think that I think that if you start off at the beginning, you're really grasping for straws as to the specificity of the current syndrome. And I think that the thing that really captures my uh, captures my attention is twofold. First, this patient who hasn't sought care for 20 years is choosing to come in that immediately should grab our attention. And then when you're in the world of, hey, I think there's something subacute to chronic going on as evidenced by the chronicity of all the symptoms that we were first hearing. The chronic equivalent of sinus tachycardia, which is an acute finding that grabs our attention acutely, is weight loss. So in the world of chronic diseases, the most important vital sign to reliably expect to gauge and influence your thinking is weight loss. And so for me, if I were, Bob, if I were at this juncture right now in the case we're proceeding more slowly, I would, pro the first thing I'd really want to know if I am blinded to the exam that, um, that is before me just laying eyes on the patient, I'd want to know the delta and the weight. So in real life, as, as we often do in the ED, I want to know what an old picture looks like, and I want to know what the weight is. But the truth is that the data that came to us on exam rapidly changes the calculus and immediately shifts this into the world of the unusual. And the world of the unusual is a combination of a fever and a diastolic murmur. Now, that should trigger a reflex. That trigger should be that this patient has infectious endocarditis until proven otherwise. But in real life, if you're coming to that conclusion after laying a stethoscope on a patient, you should probably slow down. And the reason to slow down here is um, the findings that we have subsequently on the labs. And again, I'm flying through this because you do not expect a patient to have marked hyper eosinophilia in the context of what is already a rare scenario invoking infective endocarditis in moment two of seeing a patient. So mm -hmm. you immediately have to realize, hold on, I really got to slow down. And let me just make a list of the things that are really important here. And I think what's really, really important, what has to be explained is inflammation, this person's febrile, diastolic murmur, and the fact that this patient has hyper eosinophilia. And by the way, I, I neglected to read off the uh, the lights, and uh, you see there that the uh, the creatinine is one point five as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, that, I think. Thank you for emphasizing that because I think that's the that's the other segment that we're seeing. We're seeing that not only does this patient have cardiac consequences of this il illness, that there are also very specific renal abnormalities. I would ordinarily, in a rapid reasoning that we're doing now with a complicated case, kind of dismiss an AKI like this. But with the UA highlighted, the UA highlighted with pyuria and hematuria, I'm not so comfortable dismissing that. Mm -hmm. So where are we at? I think we are dealing with a multi-organ disease process that is inflammatory in nature, that has affected the heart in a very unique way, in a diastolic murmur. The location of the diastolic murmur is important here because it's at the apex, which reflexively would have you thinking about the mitral valve, and then what kind of mitral valve uh, issue would be diastolic in nature, that's mitral stenosis. There's a big caveat there, though. If you're thinking endocarditis, unless you're thinking of a whopping big Goomba that's blocking the valve, you're usually thinking um, that the patient does not have a stenotic issue, has a regurgitant issue. So that triggers another knowledge nugget, which is sometimes patients with aortic regurgitation can actually have their murmur jet be located in the apex. Mm -hmm. So I would be open to actually being misled by the location of the murmur here and for it to be in the, in the aortic valve. So... Um, the, and then, then the, the final segment is the hypereosinophilia here. That's important. It's important because it's uh, the f more than 5,000 eosinophils is very, very specific. A lot of times eosinophils are noise and not diagnostically helpful. Here, we have to explain the eosinophilia. Great. That's, that's terrific. Very helpful in terms of the way. So you're, you're basically looking in, in a world of non-specificity, a fever, weight loss, 
not feeling well, seeing a doctor for the first time in centuries. You're looking for things you can hang your hat on. And it sounds like the murmur is one, the EOs are another. Sounds like the kidneys you think sort of are a trailing indicator that, that it's more likely that that's not a primary thing. It's, it's associated with whatever, whatever systemic process is going on. When you do the two ones you're hanging your hat on, it sounds like you were sort of instinctively, I got to worry about endocarditis, fever, and new murmur. We don't know for sure it's new, by the way. Um, um, and then you layer on EOs. Is there is there something there that that connects those two, or are you thinking about these in sort of two now differential diagnoses that you're going to try to Venn diagram but aren't obviously connected? I think that's a fantastic question that hits a really important clinical reasoning point, which is when you have two abnormalities, how can you connect them? The most important thing to be immediately open to is they're connected by a common denominator. PJP and Toxo are connected by an underlying HIV. And so that's the first thing to wonder here. But our more reflex. Let me, let me just say for people with my vintage PC, uh, PJP is what we oh. used to call pneumocystis and, and <laughs> pneumocystis pneumonia. So they got that. I'm glad we're tag teaming this. That, uh, that's, important, right. uh, that's an important uh, um, correction. So um, underlying denominator, but usually our reflexes is to think, how do they do this to each other? So as a general rule of thumb, whenever you have eosinophils this high, they can unleash devastation endovascularly on any organ, including the heart. So mm -hmm. um, the EOs can be doing this to the heart without specific consequences in the heart. Um, so that'd be the first sort of non-specific manifestation is the EOs are the root of it all. And the cardiac consequences and the renal consequences are just a, con a direct consequence of hyper eosinophilia independent of the underlying cause. Mm. Um, so that'd be an important way not to be meaning, meaning the, meaning the EOs are like attacking the heart. What, what's yeah. going on? You know, uh, eosinophilic myocarditis can occur as a eosinophilic endomyocarditis can occur regardless of the cause of the eosinophilia, as long as the EOs are very high and mm -hmm. it is a devastating, aggressive, destructive and hyperthrombotic condition. Mm -hmm. So this could be toxicara from the cat dog exposure causing eosinophilic myocarditis. This could be a cancer from a, a hyper eosinophilic cancer causing the cardiac damage. But, but I think the more morbid hypothesis is infectious in nature. And I would worry that this patient has maybe two things. This patient has infective endocarditis as a vulnerability from a hyper eosinophilic malignancy. So uh, I would be very deliberate about keeping these, th these threads open and independent mm -hmm. because there isn't an obvious slam dunk connection mm -hmm. and the possibility of multiple diagnoses in somebody who's been out of care for so long mm -hmm. is certainly not zero. Okay. So in your mind, you're doing the Occam's razor versus mm -hmm. hiccup thing. Is, is it one thing that unifies it, but you're staying open to the possibility that he's got two things, but it's a little weird to have two completely independent, rare findings. You got a new diastolic murmur and a, a new ES, a pretty high level of ESFs. Um Okay. Uh, and you said the urine and the kidney thing, that the creatinine 1.5 would, you'd almost normally just sort of wave at it, but the urine makes you a little bit sort of wondering, is there, is that connected? How, how do you, what, what does that make you think about? Yeah, I think that um, in all comers, the base rate of AKI and a systemic syndrome would tell you that it's in the plumbing. It's pre-renal, though, and especially in an older man, making sure you're not being fooled by post-renal diseases are simple things that we go through uh, in ED. Here, the question will be the UA is abnormal. It's showing that there is both pyuria and hematuria, implicating the possibility of both glomerular disease and interstitial disease. Now, you're already thinking of something endovascular with the heart. So glomerulonephritis is definitely on the hook just for that connection alone. And then when you're thinking of EOs, pyuria and infiltration of the interstitium as part of an eosinophilic disease is a connection that is a robust one. So for me, I think if I saw this person and kind of just gestalted what their weight is, I wouldn't be surprised if we're dealing with this scenario, that he's actually fairly cachectic and that his baseline creatinine should be 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 1.5 represents a marked AKI. Mm -hmm. What would we do in real life? Trend things. Trend the creatinine uh, with some hemodynamic adjustments, probably fluid, and trend the UA. And if there's persistent signal, you can latch on to that. In real life, a lot of these cases, a lot of the kidney stuff washes away as a plumbing issue with an underlying chronic cause of kidney disease like hypertension and diabetes as the cause of the uh, UA abnormality. 
Okay. And maybe one more question. We'll move uh, probably a couple more. I think that I think there's a lot here, and I want to yeah. sort of make sure if we buy up to your brain sufficiently at this point. Uh, he's hypoxic a little mm -hmm. bit, and some crackles in the lungs. Are you just saying whatever it is that's causing his murmur is sort of causing some fluid back up in his lungs, or are you wondering about there's something going on there? Yeah, great question. The, the, the general theme in a systemic disorder is two big buckets. Is this, is the systemic disorder independently infiltrating separate organs, or is it a simple connection through the plumbing? And so you might make that, you might say, hey, the heart is the center of gravity here, and backwards problems in the lungs and forward problems in the kidney are a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. And here I'd say that um, a close JVP exam will help you connect or disconnect those things because you'd expect the plumbing to reverberate back into the neck. Effusions will help you make that connection too. So um, truth be told, I probably shouldn't have glossed over the hypoxemia and somebody who's has an, has an oxygen mask in front of you in real life, you probably wouldn't gloss over it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would evaluate that independently knowing the connection could be sim a sim simply a plumbing issue rather than a systemic disease going to the lungs, heart, and kidney. It's interesting. So 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 you're, you're kind of, is this something that's actually, it's not just involving heart, but also involving lungs and maybe also involving kidneys, or is this really just something involving heart and then fluid backing up and hemodynamic consequences or playing out in both lungs and kidneys. That's where you're playing with those two different hypotheses. Yeah, I have so much respect for our cardiologists because the, the many times when the heart do, does its thing and doesn't work very well, you're often wondering, are they is the patient altered, hypoxemic, kidney, pulses issues, are they all a separate issue or are they all from the heart? And that that's hard to tease out sometimes. Yeah, okay. And maybe last question, We as I look at things that are red, uh, HCV antibody positive, do anything for you? A great example of how um, a, a large fraction of patients with exposure to hepatitis C uh, clear their virus. And so this patient isn't at risk of hepatitis C-related complications, but you might want to ask, well, how did this hepatitis C uh, exposure occur, and does that beget risk factors for other diseases? Meaning, has he been a drug user in the past, and is that his risk factor for endocarditis or that kind of thing? Exactly. You might think injection drug use. You might think prior transfusions. You might think concomitant alcohol use. Uh, uh, well, we, we have the concomitant alcohol. Yeah, some alcohol, alcohol use, yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Let's let's go on. Terrific. Uh, okay. Hang on a sec. There we go. All right. The team was a little worried about fever, crackles, hypoxemia, reasonable, and started on treatment for CAP, although I suspect they didn't think that was the entire explanation. Uh, and the workup for eosinophilia was sent, including stool owned peas that were negative. Uh, stool GI PCR was negative, B12 was normal, strongloides IgG was positive. Get back to that in a little bit. Uh, hypoxemia worsened with oxygen requirement worsening to eight liters over a couple of days. Now he becomes progressively somnolent, uh, but is uh, seen as alert and oriented on, on an exam without any focality. His antibiotics were broadened. Uh, he gets some imaging, uh, no evidence of PE, but he has diffuse bilateral nodular consolidations and ground glass opacities involving all lobes. And because of his CNS abnormalities, he has a brain MRI with and without contrast that shows multifocal punctate infarcts throughout his supertentorium. Okay, so we have a lot more information, including his own clinical course, which seems to be worsening, um, despite uh, at least pneumonia antibiotics, and now some evidence of something going on with brain and maybe something going on with lung that's more than just uh, the pipes, as you call them. Uh, so go ahead and take us through how you're thinking about it now. Uh, yeah, I know. I think um, the evidence for something endovascular is very robust now. Um, I'll just start off with, with the finding that surprised me the most, which is the strokes. I think um, the fact that the confusion ensued and the MRI followed doesn't surprise me, but it certainly wasn't evident on initially. As, as a general schema, whenever you're thinking about a patient who's had multiple thrombotic events, there really, there's really one of two possibilities. Either the patient has a really bad hypercoagulable condition causing independent clots everywhere, or they have an, a not so bad condition, but it's located in a bad location. So is it bad location versus bad condition? And I think here, the, there's a case for both. We certainly have evidence for a problem in a bad location, endovascular in the heart, um, basically throwing off emboli 
uh, to the brain. But as we talked about, es hyper eosinophilia is one of the most hypercoagulable conditions we know. So you could easily, I think I'd be satisfied with the explanation that the eos eosinophils are possibly the driver of the thrombosis and, and they independently can cause the strokes. But in the face of the murmur, you're, I think I'd be worried that there's something in the heart that is flicking off into the brain. Hmm. And the something in the heart, does that, are you, you're still in endocarditis world? Or are you feeling like there's got to be something different going on here? Yeah, I think the vast majority of thromboembolism to the brain uh, is from one of two reasons. Either there's atrial fibrillation, uh, which I don't remember we, uh, we mentioned. Not that we've seen yet. No. Yeah. Um, or that there's a, a there's a valvular issue, and that valvular issue can be infectious. In the context of cancer, it can be non-infectious endocarditis, like morantic endocarditis. And a very unique uh, manifestation that's only at play here because of the EOs is you have a spontaneous LV thrombosis. So you can have an LV thrombus without the common scenario where you have an acute myocardial infarction doing it from a from eosinophilic myocarditis. So that would be uh, one uh, those those would be the ways that I would kind of simply connect them. Okay, um, let's ask, we have an audience response question, uh, and, and obviously, Robbie, you think about this too, but let's ask the audience, what would you do next? Would you get a TTE or maybe even TE if you needed? Uh, but let's start with a TTE, a bronch with BAL, start steroids, start antifungal coverage. Go ahead and answer that. All right, so they say in politics, I think we can call this one. So let's go ahead and end the poll. And uh, let me see if I can share the results. Yeah, hopefully you can see that on your screen. 88% said TTE. -T -T uh, one person, probably a pulmonologist, wants a bronch with BAL. Uh, we got four out of 43, 9% who want antifungal coverage. Absolutely nobody was interested in starting steroids. So let me stop that. And uh, let's go on to the next one. So, Robbie, what, what, would, what would you do? Yeah, I think that I, I agree that the steroids are probably the, the uh, definitely in the depths of your pockets now. And I wouldn't get close to them in large part because the, po the positive strongyloides here invokes the possibility of strongyloides hyperinfection syndrome. You're seeing devastating eosinophilia everywhere. You're seeing the stuff in the lungs. Um, so I think what would I do? I think in real life, I'd be really waiting for the blood cultures to come back because you would invoke the idea that this person has metastatic infection with the possibility of strong gelidis hyperinfection. That might explain uh, a lot of what we're doing. Um, let's, let's, let's take a yeah. uh, take a pause. Yeah, sure. As they say in Silicon Valley, let's double click on that. Okay. So tell us what strong gelidis hyperinfection is and how you interpreted that strong gelidis result. Yeah, so the strongyloides IgG is fairly specific for having had strongyloides, and the most people who've had it, um, it's one of the unique parasites that actually maintains its complete cycle in the human host. So I think it's fair to assume, to start with the assumption that this person ha has strongyloides. Most people who have strongyloides have it contained in their GI tract, but a fraction of those patients, either because of steroid exposure or other immunocompromising conditions, which can be subtle, it can be HTLV infection, that strongyloides no longer um, stays limited to the GI tract, but goes everywhere. And the place that is, it is most apt to go is the skin, usually around the umbilicus and the lungs. And so I think it's important to invoke that possibility here. Um, because tr you might even, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people would even consider empiric uh, strongyloides treatment mm -hmm. in somebody this sick with strongyloides in the background. So I'll, I'll say a quick word about it. It was the first paper I ever wrote was on a patient I saw in med school who was in a coma for a month before we figured out that he had strongyloides hyperinfection. And it was a patient with lupus who was put on steroids who everybody thought had lupus cerebritis and turned out to have strong lead. The other thing you can do is when it goes into hyperinfection syndrome, it begins burrowing through your colon and can make your colon very leaky. So you could have both strong colitis hyperinfection and then a bunch of bacteria, often yeah. multiple bacteria in your blood cultures. So you wonder a little bit about that as well, that, you know, is it not just strong colitis, but, but co coexistent infection? A lot of unwelcome friends for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, and you want to keep the steroids away because obviously this could be a bad infection, could be strong alloides, which would bring it up. If it was strong alloides, hyperinfection, you're saying there is some, it's not just going to, strong alloides sort of hangs out happily in somebody's body for often decades and then becomes hyperinfection when they're immunocompromised. So it's got to be some underlying immunocompromised state that would have made that happen. And we don't know what that is yet if it were to happen. Uh, and But it would explain brain stuff, maybe does it explain lung stuff? Does it explain the heart, if that's what's going on? Yeah, the, the lung stuff, definitely, because the uh, the, uh, par uh, the uh, parasite can actually migrate to the lung. The one case that I saw in real life was over at, over at the general one. The patient actually had Strongy coming out of the ET tube. Um, so the, the pattern that you see here can be consistent with Strongy. The heart stuff, not so much. Um, I don't have that as a robust thing. But again, that can be just a consequence of the EOs alone, regardless of the underlying cause. Great. So you would have on this list the possibility, based on that result of even starting anti-strongloides cover, anti-parasitic coverage, but you would definitely get a TE. Would you be doing a bronch as well? You need to explore what's going on in his lungs? You know, I think that the, the, the clinical stability makes the bronch question a little bit uh, tricky here. I, I would definitely do a TTE. I don't have enough expertise to make the call on the bronch. Um, I, I, the specificity of a diastolic murmur is much higher than the specificity of GGOs and nodular consolidations. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably, if I had to pick, I'd probably go with an echo, but I wouldn't be surprised if the echo is nonspecific and the bronch clinches the answer in some cases. So it's a tough one for me, but I'd start with the echo. And you're, you're musing early on about the EOs and what they're about, and you said there's, there's, there's sort of primary EO syndromes and EOs could be from parasite, could be from cancer. How hard would you be looking for where the EOs are coming from? Very, very hard. I think the answer will lie in the EOs. And we have some early clues. We have the, some early clues that there are morphological abnormalities associated with the eosinophilia, which helps us lean one way. There's mm -hmm. only two ways we can lean. Are the EOs being pulled into the blood by a, a trigger? And that trigger is often atopic, but can be infectious, can be autoimmune, and can be endocrinologic in nature. So are they being pulled? And if they're being pulled, they should look normal mm -hmm. um, or they may look activated. Here are the hyper-segmented neutrophils along with the, with the abnormal appearing eosinophils have me worried that this patient might have a primary uh, eosinophilic neoplasm for which he's at the appropriate age. It's usually middle-aged people like him. And is that a kind of total body PET scan thing? Is that a bone marrow biopsy? How do you pursue that possibility? Yeah, I think that... Uh, I think that um... There are some subtle clues that you can gain. Uh, uh, some of these patients with MPNs have a high vitamin B12, but you definitely don't want to use that to anchor on your clues. I think most of these patients, you're probably going to need uh, a bone marrow to, to uncover the cause of their uh, uh, MPN. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, see what else we found out. So imaging uh, did have a TTE, injection fraction fine, LV hypertrophy, no segmental abnormalities, severe subvalular mitral calcification, with cortal thickening and moderate mitral stenosis. Patient continue to have fever uh, on antibiotics without any other clinical changes. ID and cardiology were consulted due to the concern for culture negative endocarditis. We'll assume the cultures therefore were negative. Given persistent fever, multifocal infarcts, uh, the TEE was performed, did not see anything different than what they saw on the TTE. Repeat blood cultures negative, additional infectious uh, workup was sent, and an autoimmune workup sent for evaluation of persistent fever. Is that where your head is at as well? Yeah, you know, I think that what, what just happened is you found, you know, we talked about how sometimes the UA just represents the patient's underlying CKD. And I think here, you have to really question the value of the diagnostic murmur. We found that this patient has mitral stenosis. And given his age, it's very possible that the cardiac stuff is true, true, and unrelated and represents something that he's had, as you alluded to. We don't know the murmur is new. And now we've confirmed the condition is old. So what I'm doing to simplify this problem, and as I'm saying, this is an, this is an inflammatory syndrome characterized by uh, thrombotic manifestations in the brain, characterized by marked hyper eosinophilia, and trying to keep it as simple as that. So now my gaze would be averted to, what are the infections that trigger this eosinophilia? There's only really one autoimmune condition that can do this, which is eGPA, and wondering whether the spinning the urine and looking for GN might take us that way. What, is, so what, is e, what does eGPA mean? Thank you for uh, um, thank you for that question. So EGPA stands for eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. 
Um, and it is, um, it's really, the name is, it's a great summary. It is a hyper eosinophilic condition that is an angiitis. It's a vasculitis characterized by granulomas on, on biopsy. Did it used uh, to be called something else? Yes. You know, uh, I made a commitment to not, um, I, to, to try to avoid uh, referring to the older names. Um, so, uh, the older EGB names did. were by someone who had yes. the Nazi party or something. Correct. Like that, that they Correct. Got it. Correct. All right. So you're not going to tell us what it used to be called. All right. Yeah. We're going to have to look it up. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. But uh, really an interesting cognitive twist there. So you took that echo, which you're saying we were sort of looking for endocarditis and a vegetation to explain the stylistic murmur. When you see that the murmur can be explained by mitral stenosis, you're now not only not glomming onto that, you're now essentially discarding the heart to say there's nothing... There's no syndrome of fever and eosinophilia and whatever else this is that causes mitral stenosis. So the mitral stenosis now becomes background noise. It must, it must be, he just has mitral stenosis. It's a coincidence. It's a red herring and you're kind of blowing it off. Is that essentially what you're doing? You know, Bob, I think the hardest thing about clinical reasoning isn't solving the problem. It's knowing what problem to solve. Yes. And that signal versus noise is so hard. So um, because we're, we, you know, we're trying to solve this case in, in, in a rapid manner, I'm making that assumption, but I'm opening, open to it being wrong. Okay. Mitrosomosis is a chronic condition for decades. This person hasn't been sick for that long. So that disconnect is, is, uh, is, is a working hypothesis for now. Okay. No, I just really, I mean, I think one of the great purposes of this is people sort of see how you're thinking. And I think that was a very interesting twist that that was part of your fact set in the beginning that you really, I got to solve this diastolic murmur. And now you feel like in a way you've solved it and it actually has nothing to do with this case, which is really very interesting. It takes you into a, into a somewhat different place. Uh, okay. Got a bunch of ID labs. I don't see anything red on the ID lab grow program there. Um, and CRP elevated, ESR mildly elevated, total IgE elevated, uh, complements I guess are normal, anti-MPO normal, antiproteinase negative, UA still modestly active, and uh, UPCR 530. Uh, any of that uh, intriguing to you? Yeah, I think that infectious disease, sort of like rapid 10,000-foot uh, view, the infectious disease uh, serologies are pretty helpful because I think the the migratory parasites that we're really looking for, which is Toxicara and Trichinella, their antibody performance char characteristics are pretty good. Unfortunately, that's not true for the antibodies that we obtained to look for EGPA, so um, specifically the anti-MPO and the anti-PR3. Only about 50% of patients with EGPA are seropositive or have that antibody. So while the, those specific infections have reduced in their probability, you can't eliminate EGPA simply based on the lack of an ANCA. Only half of patients will have it. Okay. And so when you're invoking EGPA, does that explain, is, is that infiltrate the lungs? Does that cause, uh, cause clots? Is that, when you were talking earlier, some ways we've toggled from you talking about hyper eosinophilic syndromes and now kind of one in particular, is that the one, or are you still wondering about other eosinophilic syndromes? Yeah. Um, so I think the classic presentation of EGPA is one that spans decades. Unfortunately, we don't have the classic evolution in this patient because he hasn't seen care for decades, but most patients will begin in their 30s to 40s to have an adult onset asthma, and that's your first clue. Of course, we don't know if this patient has or doesn't have asthma. He's too sick to figure that out now. But it is a disease that is centered on the lungs initially and then progresses to involve other organs. And the progression occurs in two ways. It occurs through eosinophilic damage. So the eosinophils infiltrate the heart, they infiltrate the GI tract, and then you get a vasculitis. And the vasculitis classically will affect the peripheral nerves and less commonly affect the kidney. So it's usually a disease that kind of slowly begins. Um, I imagine some patients, unfortunately, are caught when the, the plane's taken off, but usually there's a long, long, long runway. Got it. Okay, let's uh, move on. Um, I, we've gone through all this already. A clinical course, finally, a, a use for ivermectin uh, given for the treatment of strong <laughs> <All right. laughs> I've waited three years for, for actually an appropriate use of ivermectin. Other antibiotics stopped given in negative infectious workup. Eosinophils remain markedly elevated. You see the curve there. Heme is consulted for the persistent eosinophilia, and you see 
PCR able, cytogenetics, flow cytometry, all negative. Hospital day six, the patient has 10 out of 10 substernal chest pain with troponin of 0.5 and EKG shows uh, ST elevation in the inferior leads. Uh, we got some ST depression in the lateral leads and we even have some Q waves in the anterior leads. There's a code heart uh, called. He's given the usual cocktail taken for left heart cath. He has a coronary thromboembolism uh, uh, that is not able to be removed. No evidence of plaque rupture or luminal narrowing. Cardiac MRI shows severe mitral valve calcification along the papillary muscles. Chest pain resolves, does not recur. TTE unchanged from uh, prior. Hospital day three, his oxygen requirements get even worse with uh, up to 12 liters of high flow. Repeat CT, probably even worse, new areas of central lobular nodules and nodular con consolidation, the lower lobes, although his previous errors, uh, areas of GGO are now improved. So we're heading to the end here, uh, and, and the chiefs have uh, kindly summarized it, but I think you've, you've made it clear all along kind of the summary. 60-year-old, 68-year-old man with past history of hypertension and AUD, who's been out of care for a while, presents with weakness, dyspnea, weight loss, and found out, found out persistent fevers, eosinophilia, subvalvular mitral calcification with, as you say, mitral stenosis as well, and multifocal nodular consolidations on CT, who has a hospital course complicated by worsening hypoxemic respiratory failure in hospital STEMI, multifocal brain infarcts, and AKI with an active urine sediment. That's, uh, that's a lot to take in. So this is it. Uh, how, are you, how do you put this together? Anything else you would want test-wise? And any therapies you would start? Um, well, thank you, uh, um, Anna and Viri, for the great summary. Maybe you can go back to that slide. And uh, all I would try to do is try to simplify the problem because I think yeah. this is way, way too complicated. So maybe you take a minute and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you a visual aid um, that I have pulled up to, to share yeah. with you all. So, so, so you want me to do, do you have it up and ready? Well, I have it ready, but um, maybe I can try to make the, oh, actually, yeah, let me just share it and I'll try to make it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. Fantastic. Okay. You do your thing. All righty. Um, just give me a thumbs up if you see cryptic eosinophilia on the screen. Yes, we do. We All do. right. Fan fantastic. Okay. So I think the first part of this analysis is to actually, um, I try to make the case for why this is the root of it all. And I think the root of it all comes from the knowledge that EOs this bad can cause everything we've seen. Hyper eosinophilia can cause, is just so thrombotic and so devastating that I think the brain stuff, the lung stuff, the heart stuff, and the kidney stuff can all come down to on bystander damage from the eosinophils, which why I'm actually glad, Bob, we had steroids as an option initially, because you do, part of you wants to stop that damage that eosinophils are doing. But for me, this case comes down to the eosinophilia in large part because the consequences of this, this severe eosinophilia are predictable and this high in eosinophil often leads to an answer. So uh, the visual that you have is specifically tiered with infection and autoimmune at the top because you wanna analyze those before you move forward thinking about the cancers and the end organ diseases. So I, haven't, I don't have a list of it, the, the uh, infections here um, uh, listed out, but I think that here the exposure history and the, and the job we've done makes them a little bit less likely. The fact that this patient didn't pan out to have an overt vasculitic syndrome, no glomerulonephritis, no modernitis multiplex, I think we can move past ANCA uh, uh, negative eGPA. And so for me, this is, this is the spotlight now is on malignancy. That tends to be the journey that we take when we're ha when we have inflammation NOS and we don't make a, we don't land on infection and we don't land on autoimmune and off malignancy starts to take a bigger and bigger space. And I think we're seeing here there's a, there's a nuance with the kinds of malignancies. There are perineoplastic hyper eosinophilic syndromes, usually lymphomas, or there are primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And the primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes are actually further broken down into three categories. Either it's a myeloid hyper eosinophilic syndrome, MHES, a lymphocytic hyper eosinophilic syndrome, or an idiopathic hyper eosinophilic syndrome. And I think here the work that we've done 
is to make infection less likely, to make autoimmune less likely. And I think that there's really no robust case for a perineoplastic process. So for me, I'm in the primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes. The hypersegmented neutrophils were an early indicator of the possibility of, of myeloid M hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So I'm between that and between idiopathic or cytogenetic negative hyper eosinophilic syndrome. But long story short, I do, I don't know the answer. And I don't think it's, I think it's hard to know that with confidence right now. Part of you is always holding your breath for an infection that snuck by you or eGPA that really fools you. But I think it's time to start the, to suppress the immune system. That I'm com more confident about than the answer. But um, for the purposes of the exercise, I would be most worried about a hyper eosinophilic syndrome, either M or idiopathic. Great. Uh, let's see, let's bring that back up. Okay, well, thank you, Robbie. That was, uh, that was fabulous. And so your next step, rather than getting into bone marrow or any of that, your next step would be to start steroids, it sounds like. And, and as both treatment, but also to some extent, diagnostic test? Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if it's diagnostic. Um, part of me is wondering whether the steroids will just shut down any eosinophilia. So I, I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but I, I think it's the only way not to prevent this disease from getting worse. But I'm so, so glad that I, I in real life, I don't make this decision by myself. It yeah. would be one that I would be paralyzed in doing, but uh, uh, would be definitely uh, advocating for. Great. Okay. So final diagnosis sounds like a primary eosinophilic syndrome. Sounds like both infiltrating organs, but also causing thrombophilia, a lot of clots, coronary, brain, uh, and maybe even other organs. Okay. Multidisciplinary meeting was held between the hospital medicine team, hematology and pulmonology to discuss the patient. Primary team was most concerned for hyper eosinophilic syndrome, given the persistent eosinophilia, eosinophilia and thrombotic complications. Bohm raised the concern for eosinophilic pneumonia, given the appearance on the chest CT. A BA and lung biopsy were discussed, but tissue diagnosis was deferred due to concerns for the safety of intubation. Patient was started on prednisone 40 a day for treatment of both hyper eosinophilic syndrome and eosinophilic pneumonia. Started on rivaroxaban for cardioembolic events and for thrombotic risk associated with eosinophilia. Although the team's acknowledged data for this is limited. Patient was weaned to room air and eosinophilia normalized. He was ultimately discharged on a prednisone taper with a plan for repeat CT in four weeks, which was notable for improved appearance of his nodular consolidation and ground glass opacities. So final diagnosis, I don't have to say it because you said it, hyper eosinophilic syndrome complicated by eosinophilic pneumonia, endocardial fibrosis and thromboembolic phenomena leading to MI and CVA. So the chiefs wrote this before your presentation, but obviously I can, <laughs> I can hardly endorse it. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Before we bring on a couple of expert discussants, any final reflections on the case and any teaching points that you want to make? No, I, I'm, well, I'm just so grateful for uh, uh, for everybody who took care of this patient and who, uh, the chiefs are putting this case together. And Bob, your, your questions along the way, they really pushed me to try to be as uh, clear as I can be. I think the biggest takeaway from this case um, are the re-emphasis of the journey of inflammation. I think we always go infection, autoimmune cancer, infection, autoimmune cancer. I think um, the biggest sort of 10,000 foot view reasoning one is is trying to simplify the problem. And you got so much data. And I think it's easy to be paralyzed about like, where do I go from here? And this case is both incredibly complicated, obviously, but also incredibly simple. Because if all that you focused on was EOs greater than 5K, you would arrive at the answer. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to me how medicine is overwhelming yet beautifully simple. And so it is a lifelong journey to, to, try to, to try to get closer and closer to the crux of a case. But I think that's what this case emphasizes for me is to really try to work hard to, to crystallize the core essence of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been playing around a lot with uh, all the new fancy AI stuff and it, it, it can pro it can, and I actually played with it with this case, it can get you to the differential diagnosis of stuff quite well. The question is how good it is at parsing all of the facts and deciding which ones are important, which ones can be discarded. I think that was the lesson as I watched you kind of uh, you work your way through it is which ones you're holding on to, which ones you're going to sort of put in the parking lot because of new data. It's really, it's, it's interesting and it's really a complex problem.
I never Sorry. thought I would disregard a diastolic murmur in a clinical reasoning exercise. Never. Yeah, I guess we can yeah. say that's it. true. That's a, it's a gutsy thing to do. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and uh, learn a little bit more. We have two expert discussants. The first is Annabelle Frank, who's a clinical fellow in Heme Onc, and will take us through the hematologic and, uh, and I guess, uh, oncologic aspects of this. So, Annabelle, I think I'm going to run your slides. Why don't you come on? Great. Well, thank you for that amazing discussion. And, and for the for the audience, by the way, the reason she is mystery panelist one is in case Robbie came on before, we didn't want him to see who the discussants were. So <laughs> thank you for being here. Okay, so I will be discussing eosinophilia and specifically we'll talk about the diagnosis, um, the complications and the treatment, which have already been somewhat highlighted. So you can go to the next slide. You can do the next slide. Thanks. So hyper eosinophilia is defined as eosinophils greater than 1.5 or 1500. So in this case, the patient's eosinophils were over 5,000 and that puts it in the severe category of um, eosinophilia. You can also diagnose it if there's an abundance of EOs on bone marrow biopsy or another um, pathologic specimen. Well, in terms of the categories, this may seem simple, but it's actually very confusing and complicated. So you can have primary eosinophilia, which is due to an underlying hematologic malignancy. This would be um, something like eosinophilic leukemia, or it could be another myeloid malignancy where the eosinophils are part of the malignant clone. So they are part of the malignancy. Um, so something like CML, where the eosinophils are part of the malignancy. And as we noted earlier, BCR ABL was checked in this case. Then secondary eosinophilia due to, as we're all very familiar with, infections. You can have it due to medications, et cetera. Or also malignancy goes into this category as well. So that could be a solid tumor malignancy or even other um, hematologic malignancies where the eosinophils are not part of the malignant clone. So a T cell malignancy where there's then reactive eosinophilia. So that's a little confusing how the malignancies fit into both primary and secondary. Um, but no matter what, we're going to be evaluating for all these causes. Um, and then categories three and four are really interrelated. So idiopathic hyper eosinophilia, that is a diagnosis of an exclusion where you cannot find a cause of um, primary or secondary eosinophilia, you have these high eosinophils. And as Robbie stated, regardless of the underlying cause, they can cause damage to organs. And if they do cause end organ damage, then you go from the idiopathic hyper eosinophil category to the hyper eosinophilic syndrome category. So really three and four are just on a spectrum together. And then on the next slide, um, there's a diagram. This is seeing the same thing another way. So you have high eosinophils defined as greater than 1500. Then you have your sec your primary causes where it's part of a malignant clone, secondary causes that could be a malignancy, it could be an infection, et cetera. And then you have this other diagnosis of exclusion where there's no cause identified the hyper eosinophilia, You've excluded a lot of other things. You can label it as idiopathic hyper eosinophilia. However, if there's end organ damage, then you're going to be labeling it as hyper eosinophilic syndrome, as we did for this patient. For secondary causes, there's a few mnemonics for those of you who want that in your back pocket. China, NAACP. So um, kind of running through the common things, there's allergies, drugs, can be very hard to identify the, the drug of cause in a patient who's been hospitalized for a long time, who's had many um, many medications. We've probably all been in that situation, scouring the drug list for the past two months. Um, so many different medications can cause this. Infections, we think of parasites, but other infections can do it as well. Then neoplasms, as I was saying, that it can be a secondary cause. It's not necessarily the primary clone is going to be the eosinophil. Um, and then some funny things that um, are, uh, there's so many things on the list, this is not even comprehensive, but things like Addison's disease and um, sarcoid. So there's all kinds of secondary causes that need to be um, thought about in these cases. So one, of, one of the things that we can do to evaluate if it's a primary 
eosinophilic syndrome is just on this eosinophil fish panel. Um, and that looks for specific rearrangements that are seen in eosinophilic malignancies. Of course, you're also going to be sending bone marrow biopsy, looking for um, morphologic changes that indicate that there's an abnormality. Also, you can send a myeloid panel, just looking for any myeloid malignancy. So there's a lot of evaluation that we can do to try and identify the malignancy. Um, the field is kind of now thinking that probably for a lot of the idiopathic hyperacinophilia and the hyperacinophilic syndrome, that there might be some malignant clone that we just can't identify. So the more that we have this data about different mutations that can be seen in myeloid malignancies, the more we might understand that these idiopathic cases actually represent malignancy that we cannot fully define at this point. And probably the field will be in a very different place in a decade. So as Robbie was saying, regardless of the underlying cause, the eosinophils can be very de detrimental, can cause damage any organ. Specifically, they really can wreak havoc on the lungs, they can cause um, cardiac damage, they can damage the valves, and then it's a highly thromboembolic condition. So, um, and actually often cardiac origin for the thromboemboli. So this patient actually fits the script of kind of severe eosinophilia causing damage to multiple organs. That being said, you know, we've labeled it as hyper eosinophilic syndrome, but we, you know, we can't be 100% certain there's not some other underlying cause. But once you get to that point where you've decided these eosinophils are causing end organ damage, then you would want to treat with steroids, um, which was done for this patient. And of course, it can take a while to get to that point where you're, you've ruled out infection or as best you can and um, landed on that hyper eosinophilic syndrome diagnosis, which is just so tricky. Um, but there are situations where the EOs are so high, I've never seen this, but up to 100,000, where you would just be storing the steroids right away. Um, in, this in most cases, it's much grayer about when to start steroids and when to feel convinced that the eosinophils are the cause of the end organ damage. Annabelle, that's great. Uh, uh, how about weaning in terms of like long-term? What's uh, Assuming he, has, he obviously had a terrific response, what would you be doing if you were following him in clinic? I mean, it's it remains a very tricky clinical situation. I even think about for this case, like the strong aloides, what if that really is the underlying cause? Because sometimes treatment of strong aloides, anecdotally, it takes a few months for the eosinophils to normalize. So we still really don't know. Um, closely looking for signs that um, a myeloid malignancy is developing, you know, retesting as we understand more about the um, cytogenetic abnormalities that can occur in these myeloid malignancies causing eosinophilia. So it's really a matter of reassessment for this patient. And as Robbie mentioned, you know, could it be EGPA? Those diagnostic tests aren't perfect. So just really ongoing reassessment for um, the underlying cause and indications to treat just with steroids empirically or something else. Great, fabulous. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have one more mystery panelist. And it's Nira Bhatka, who is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine in our Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. So, Nirav, if you're out there, come on, on, come on out. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Nice to see you. I'll, I'll run the slides for you, but uh, take it from here. Okay. My challenge is now to add on top of the great uh, discussion from Robbie and Annabelle already and yourself. And I've been uh, charged with talking about eosinophil pneumonia. So, if we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, there are many conditions in which there can be eosinophils in the airspace and the airways, including many systemic conditions, uh, which Robbie and Annabelle already mentioned. Um, on this slide in particular, I want to focus on two well-known clinical syndromes that are often thought of when we say the phrase eosinophilic pneumonia. And these are syndromes in which the lungs can be affected in isolation. Um, there are also These are also conditions in which we think the eosinophils, not only the quantity, but the quality, their function, um, are causing the problem in the lung, where there are some other conditions, as Annabelle uh, noted, uh, that are associated with eosinophilia, where there is a lot more uncertainty as to the pathogenic role of the elevated eosinophil count, um, uh, especially in the lung. And so on the left here, uh, one of the clinical syndromes, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, um, often there's a, a history of an inhalational exposure, um, including smoking in many individuals. 
Uh, patients present with one to four weeks of dry cough, dyspnea, fever. They may have um, systemics, other systemic symptoms, sweats, chills. Uh, they may have pleuritic chest pain. Uh, on exam, there could be fever, tachypnea, inspiratory crackles. Imaging, relatively nonspecific with diffuse bilateral opacities. And the blood eosinophils are often not elevated unless the disease has been going on untreated for um, uh, a longer period of time. Um, yet, because of the um, acuity um, and intensity of the symptoms, patients are often presenting before the blood eosinophils get elevated. And then for acute eosinophil pneumonia, we're thinking about checking the medications, um, inquiring about uh, drug use of any kind, especially inhalational and recent radiation um, exposure to the lung. Another condition, chronic eosinophil pneumonia, we know less about the triggers for, uh, but it's also a well-described clinical syndrome. Uh, there often is a history of asthma um, or atopy um, in roughly half of individuals, uh, but again, many uh, people uh, will not have this history. Uh, more um, time period here, one to four months of cough, fever, dyspnea, weight loss, and sweats. You still get inspiratory crackles. There may be expiratory wheezes consistent with many of these individuals having asthma. Uh, and the imaging can be a little bit more helpful than in the acute variety. Uh, in about a quarter of the patients, there can be peripheral uh, opacities, uh, sort of a reverse bat wing negative um, uh, image of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And in here, the blood eosinophils are often elevated and can get as high as described in this case, um, you know, even up to 5,000 uh, per microliter. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is the uh, reverse uh, bat wing uh, negative of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Again, occurs in only about a quarter of patients with chronic, not acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, so not very sensitive, not very specific, uh, but we're seeing these peripheral opacities um, here in the upper left axial and in the coronal view on the bottom left and in the um, plain film uh, on the right. Next slide. So how do we make the diagnosis? Uh, it's through bronchoscopy. So we're looking for those eosinophils uh, to fulfill that part of the clinical syndrome, the eosinophils um, in the air spaces, in the airways. Uh, you know, in the case, um, as was presented, uh, bronchoscopy can also have a role in ruling out infection uh, prior to the uh, initiation of immunosuppression. Um, and so to get uh, these eosinophils, we're typically doing a bronchoalveolar lavage, instilling uh, saline, suctioning it back until we um, put enough in to sample the distal airways and the alveoli. On the right here, a uh, study from 1989, about 1,000 patients uh, over a couple of years at one institution, um, looking at all patients that had uh, what was considered an abnormal level of eosinophils, so greater than 5% in the BAL showing that there's a variety of conditions that can be associated with BAL eosinophilia. Um, some uh, overlap at a high percentage, uh, uh, acute and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, drug-induced um, disease as well. And then there are many others that have lower levels of eosinophilia. So we go to the next slide. And so this gets us to the differential diagnosis, which we can attack um, from a variety of angles, whether you know differential diagnosis for the symptoms, for this kind of imaging. Here on this slide, I'm taking uh, the viewpoint of the differential diagnosis in particular for BAL eosinophilia, um, going off from that table that we saw and other um, studies. At the top, we think about asthma, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, aspirin um, exacerbated respiratory disease, so these, you know, asthma and sort of more um, severe uh, uh, associated complications. Um, and then also eosinophilic bronchitis. Uh, as was mentioned, um, eosinophilic granulomatosis, polyangiitis. Uh, we check for sinus disease, neurologic symptoms, GI symptoms. Uh, there are uh, parasitic infections uh, um, uh, and a variety of fungal infections, coxy, mucor, um, then we have TB. Uh, we've seen a lot of eosinophilia, including um, in the air spaces, uh, in the setting of uh, uh, COVID, uh, and uh, despite extensive workup for other causes, uh, we can't find it. So now SARS-CoV-2 infection is listed as another uh, item in the differential. Malignancy, as was noted, and then finally, as it was in this case, hyper eosinophilic syndromes. For these uh, classic clinical conditions, acute and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, they respond typically very well to steroids. Uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia especially often requires prolonged treatment, 
relapses are common for chronic eosinophil of pneumonia, even months to years after remission, but usually the patients uh, respond promptly again. Uh, for patients that are requiring a lot of um, steroid courses uh, um, or can't be weaned down, we think about steroid sparing agents, which fortunately in the modern era include anti-IL-5 and IL-5 receptor monoclonal antibodies, so mepolizumab, benralizumab, and reslizumab. And of course, don't forget about PJP prophylaxis in the setting of chronic steroids. Got to say it as a pulmonologist. Thank, thank you, Nirav. That was terrific, terrific presentation by everybody. Uh, Robbie, if you can come on for one last second. Uh, and thank you, Annabelle, as well. And uh, Robbie, I just want you to come out for everybody to applaud either uh, in real life or, or virtually. But uh, that was a spectacular discussion. Thank and uh, we, we all learned a lot. Any final comments you want to make? No, I think that uh, this case is a very, very advanced example of what we do on a daily basis in real time with clinical reasoning. And I really hope that um, that everybody enjoyed this. I, I know it was a treat and and hopefully uh, we all feel inspired to do this, even with your cases of pneumonia, UTI and cellulitis. So Great. thank you for coming. Today. Great. And Anna and Vidi, thank you for putting it together. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, CME credit, stay on for a second. This will be posted on uh, YouTube in the next day or two. And uh, we'll see you back here again next week for another Grand Rounds. Thanks so much.